Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and dear colleagues, welcome to our first FinTech Meets. And today we will meet on blockchain. And just looking at the room, I can only say the subject is hot. So why did we, and maybe a few words on that, why did we decide to launch a new conference cycle called FinTech Meets? We will host it actually four times a year. Well, we had three good reasons to do so. The first one was to enable internally our colleagues to access easily these new technologies. The second reason was to introduce the startups of Lux Future Lab to potential users and partners. And looking around, well, there are representatives from internally from our IT sections, compliance, payment systems, and from the outside, entrepreneurs, VCs, business angels, people from the ecosystem. A third reason was definitely to communicate on the commitment which BGRB and P Paribas has towards new technologies. And speaking about that, I would like to also share with you a few news. The first one is that um, we will quite soon have within the bank a launch a team of dedicated bankers which are really catering to the very specific needs of startups, which is a great thing for our startups. The second was a FinTech Accelerator event, which we were hosting last week in Paris. Indeed, our various business lines have requested, I say requested, to work with startups. So uh, we had about 140 startups which have been pitching for this FinTech Accelerator. And of these, 10 only were selected. And believe me, I'm extremely proud to tell you that among the 10, we have one of the startups of Lux Future Lab, KYC3, Jet Gran. I'm happy you're here with us. So from what I understand, we will run the prototype here in Luxembourg. And we will definitely, I promise you, will invite Jet to be our host at one of our coming, upcoming FinTech meets. So another uh, information which maybe you got already is that our group, alongside other big banks, uh, joint uh, digital assets holding, a uh, developer of distributed ledgers. Uh, and so that is also for us as a whole group, a first introduction into this whole new technology of uh, blockchain and distributed ledgers. So all this to tell you that today we have in this room a very unique assembly made both of outside guests and of our own colleagues. I stress this fact because I think it is important and it's proof that we banks and we employees of banks are keenly aware of the new challenges ahead and what a challenge it is, blockchain. What a challenge, maybe a revolution, a disruption, we will know more after the speeches. We are extremely happy to introduce today two, I could say, champions of the subject in Luxembourg. So the first one is Michael Jackson, a partner of Mangrove. But uh, in this context, more interestingly, uh, he is the president of blockchain. The second one is Dennis Kislev, uh, who came uh, from sunny California, I do hope you're not too sad by everything which is outside and that you want to stay with us, to set up his company uh, at Lux Future Lab. And what maybe you don't know, Dennis uh, has succeeded to do something which nobody else so far has done, and that is getting a bit license from a European regulator, our CSSF. So I'm not sure that after their speeches, I cannot promise this 100%, that after their speeches, you will know all the ins and outs of blockchains. Believe me, it is quite a complex technology. But what I'm sure of 
is that after their speeches, you will have a very good understanding of what the impact of this new technology is to our, the financial industry uh, in particular. So with this, thank you, Dennis, thank you, Michael, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to see so many people interested in technology, especially technology which is so early. My life has been as a technologist, and many of the things I've been involved with, we couldn't get three people in a room, let alone 230 people, but we seem to manage. Um, as Karen said, I'm um, on the board of, uh, of blockchain.info. We're one of the largest, or we are the largest company operating with blockchain technology today within the public blockchain. We'll come to that in a second. And we issue the largest amount of software for people to use Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain on their phones, on their private wallets today, as well as providing information services to, to the industry, which I will show you some examples of in the context of what I'm going to talk about. But before starting on, on blockchain itself, I thought I'd draw a couple of short parallels into the into my past, which is the internet and the telephone industry, and why I think this is an interesting area both to invest in, but also just to be involved in. And then we'll move on to the section of how I think it's going to affect the banking industry, which is why I think most of you are here today. Um, this is us. This is where I work day to day at Mangrove Capital Partners. We invest in internet companies, as you know. One of them, the most famous one, as you probably also know, is Skype, where I was working for many years. Um, an interesting thing about internet companies or technology growth today is the speed it all works. Um, we'll just take this at the helicopter view here. We won't get onto it. The first telephone came out in 1878, and in 100 years there was basically no innovation in the telephone. Between 1878 and 1978, nothing really happened. Arguably, the user experience got worse. You could say that in the old days, you picked up the phone, you spoke to an operator who connected you to your friend, and if your friend wasn't at his house and he was at somebody else's house, probably the operator knew because it was in the village in any way, so it all worked automatically. Then we moved to robots and technology and everything, and that declined. But it took 100 years to get to 100 million users in that. And yet, look how quickly it went with all the new things we've got coming along now. Even something like Facebook, which started in 2005, 10 years ago, took no time to get to 100 million users. And WhatsApp and Instagram and Candy Crush, and these are products. And the products are developing really quickly today because you can deploy to everybody on the planet within seconds. And what you deploy is a service, something that gives value for the customer. Uh, within the telephone world, we were able to deliver very quickly free or very cheap telephone calls to anybody in the planet by passing the existing industry setup, by passing the, 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 um, the telephone companies, the large incumbent telephone companies, by taking the service layer and abstracting it, by commoditizing it. And it's this commoditization that I think is going to be affecting the financial services industry hugely with time, is that people are buying things much more very focused what they actually want to be looking at. So take a service like telephony. You used to enter a contract with, with pt and or something, and you got your cable, and you got your connections, and you got your instrument, and you got everything. And the first thing that happened was people went to the store and bought their telephone separately. They still got their line from pt and They still had all the calls going over pt and But they went and bought their telephone separately. And then there came alternative providers. I was involved with Tele2 here for a long time, and we provided alternative telephone services. We sort of unbundled the thing a little bit, and this is something which is happening to the banking industry, this unbundling. But Tele2 actually used the existing infrastructure of, of, of pt and to operate. So we built on top of that. We built an alternative company. And now when you want to make a phone call, you're in your WhatsApp or whatever, and you, your Facebook or something, and you click on the button and you make a phone call. You're not really interested in a long-term contract with pt and t You're not in. It's very transactional. It's very commoditized making a telephone call or sending a message to somebody now. And you do it in lots of different contexts. And commoditization has been the key to all of this. And commoditization is, is what's hitting, hitting the banking industry heavily, I believe, and what the blockchain can enable for, for, for companies to build on top of that to produce products that people can use over the whole world when they need them, at the time they need them, without it being a very complicated uh, relationship they need with their supplier. So we talk of the banking industry, most people have a relationship with the bank, and they have a complex relationship with the bank. They set up a form, they have a banking advisor, and they have all these sort of things. 
but moving over to a much more transactional basis. So I talk about commoditization. This is just a standard definition from somewhere random. Underlying process, customers systematically eliminate everything you perceive as being different or special about your firm or offerings and reduce you and your competition to the lowest common denominator. It's often, although not always, price. So what's the cheapest way of sending money from place to place? What's the cheapest way of getting a credit card transaction? What's the cheapest way of maintaining my account in my store or, or, or for my salary or whatever? And underlying technology is what's needed. And that underlying technology in financial services is, is a form of distributed database called the blockchain. Now, there are various types of this, um, and we'll go through them a little bit today. Some of this will be technical, but then we'll get back to some, some more, more practical examples. First of all, I thought it relevant to show where we are on blockchain. This is a chart that my company make every single day. Uh, it's the number of transactions per day. Perhaps you can't see it. But you can see we're up now at about 220,000 transactions per day running on the public blockchain. Now, 220,000 transactions a day is, is, is a fast growth from zero for sure. It's not very many transactions, though. I think if we're looking in, in this organization, that's the number of transactions that are happening in an hour or a minute or something. It's a trivial amount of transactions. In the phone world, we talk about 20 million a day, even if you're a small company. So this is nowhere yet. But why we think it's going to be strong is what it enables. And it enables a whole technology behind it, which I think we need to fundamentally understand. And that understanding I'm going to try and do in, in six slides. And it's trying to explain the fundamentals of cryptography and computer engineering and everything within six slides, which probably we shall see how we get on. If somebody goes away with some idea what we do. What a blockchain is, it's a chain of transactions. Generally today, in the banking system, we have a hierarchy of transactions. We have a list of transactions. I move money to you, you move money to you, or, or whatever. These things happen. Each transaction is individual, and, and they happen all on their own. And how you record them on the ledgers within the systems with double-entry bookkeeping, but they're basically referring across to each other, these transactions. The blockchain works in a different way. What you do is you add all the transactions on top of each other, and you encode all that information so that one transaction can't happen without everything having happened before it being intact. So what we do here is we, we take, this is a divergence in three slides into cryptography, but what we do is we take a bundle of data in, we compute a, a checksum around that, we do some mathematical, um, we, we run a mathematical formula on that that can only give one answer with one set of data. It's the fundamentals of cryptography. It's something if you're starting to learn, and this is the, probably one of the most important things that you need to understand in the 23rd century is cryptography. It used to be for spies and things like that when I did maths, but now it's in everything. It's keeping data integral. And what you do out of this, you put a load of data into the pot and you make a number at the top and it says this number, whatever it is, this string represents that amount of data. You can't ever go back to the data. The data is private, it's secret within that. And you can't ever have that same code word out of the thing on different data going in. So that data is completely intact and you get this one piece of information in it. It happens a lot. It happens on um, the way you secure databases in existing systems, for example, is you, you look at them every day, you check this out, and if it's correct, then everything else under it must not have changed and must still be correct. But what we do in the blockchain is we feed that output the next day, or the next, let's call it that, into the data. So it becomes part of the data, and we add on the new data, and then we encrypt that and get a new data into it. And what this gives is a tremendous uh, history of data. So, so what happened when you come, you come in on, on the right-hand side here and you go out on the left after time in day one, you've got this, day two, day three. But the really important thing is that day three, that number which is coming out to the next day is, is, a, is derived from all the information that ever happened since day one. So what that means is if any of that information is changed or corrupted or somebody attempts to adjust that, that number is going to, it's not going to work. This whole thing, it's going to be obvious that this is broken. And this gives an incredibly secure platform. It gives a platform where the underlying data is, is not decodable, but this control layer is completely intact. So you know within your system that nobody can change anything. So the idea of somebody going in and fiddling with the data in the system, it doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It's history. And that's very powerful because it makes the system extremely trustworthy. It means if I'm running a transaction depending on all this stuff, I know it's correct. I know it's correct. It cannot be wrong unless the fundamental maths is wrong. And maths usually is right from time to time anyway. And of course, 
that takes all this data coming in. Where do you get that data from? Well, actually, this data, I could say that's one piece of data, but there's a whole, whole ton of data going into it. There's a whole history of it, right? You've got, you've got a whole tree of data, but this, this system is built up first this way and then that way, where you've got, can you hear me? Is that better? Yeah. Um, sorry. Shall I start again? Um, the data you put in gets, get, gets encrypted, all the encrypted keys get pushed up the system and it comes out of the top, right? Now that's interesting because if you did want to go and change it, you would break it. If you change something wrong here, the number at the top would be different, somebody would apply it there, it wouldn't work anymore. And it would just break, 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 break. It would be very obvious for everybody the data's got corrupted. So that's what makes blockchains, in general, secure. But let's imagine you actually did want to change it. You said, I have all the computer power in the world. I have all the authority in the world. I really want to be able to do this. What can I do? So I made a real mistake before, something I really want to hide. So this is, this is what happens here. Imagine you have a block there. Look, look at it as building blocks. And what happens is everybody's always working on the latest one in this setup. Everybody's always working on the latest one. So imagine somebody wants to alter something in the middle. Well, they could, in theory, do that because they'd have to change the data in that, and they'd have to rush through really quickly and patch up until they got to the end of this thing. But the thing about blockchain, or at least the Bitcoin blockchain, is it's incredibly complex. It's incredibly expensive to produce one single output. So to change that lot faster than somebody can change one is going to be very difficult. You're going to have like to have 20 times the computing capacity at your, at your disposal to do that. And that's what it makes it secure in any environment, let alone in a, um, you've got to get the output of your 20 things faster than one guy can do it in one. That's why people use it in public and private systems like this. So if somebody wants to change something in the bank here, they're going to have to be tremendously powerful to do it. That's why it's secure. But um, not only that, if you put a tremendous amount of resource onto that last block, they're not just going to have to be 10 times more powerful than that resource, but that resource has got to be absolutely incredible. And the resource that's being applied into the public blockchain today is enormous. It's an incredible amount of computing capacity, and it's, you, we don't have 20 times that compute capacity in the world available to deploy onto this problem. So we can be sure that this blockchain is completely secure. So that's, we click through that. And that makes it, this is where it makes it fantastic for a lot of regulators and a lot of public uh, things. It's impossible to forge your cheat. You can look back on the information. This information is actually public, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. I'll show you an example in just a second. And regulatory oversight, counter to what you see in the press, becomes actually rather easier rather than more difficult. It's a different challenge, but, but it's a, a foreseeable challenge. And what you hear a lot about Bitcoin is it's all sort of, it's all in the ether and nothing happens and regulators can't get their head on it, around it or anything like that. Regulatory oversight is actually very easy because the blocks that we talk about uh, creating here, cryptographically creating, we can look at. And we could, this is a, uh, an output of a screenshot that, that, that our company make. This is the sort of thing that we, we do. And this is the, the, what we're looking at is that block that was on the right of that thing that we've built up. What does it consist of? And there's all sorts of data about that block. But you can see the number of it. You can see there were 2,000. You can't read it, but you can see there's 2,562 transactions in that block. So in that period of time, 2,500 transactions between people were added into this block. People put it all together. You can see where it was finally uh, the first person to check that it was done correctly was in Iceland. Um, and you can see when it was done. So you can see this block was created on the 2nd of March at 8 o'clock this morning. That was when I did this, a bit late. And you can see what happened there. And there's all sorts of information about that. It's, it's, it's sort of publicly accessible. So the underlying transaction isn't publicly accessible, but the oversight is in this system. And this is a big misconception, I think, you see in the, in the industry about, about the traceability of Bitcoin uh, through the world. It's a different challenge. It's, we'll go on to some anonymity things earlier. And a lot of the regulators are, are beginning to understand that. Um, and I'm happy to say that the Luxembourg regulators are understanding that. They're understanding it at the technical level. The American regulators, less so. They're talking much more about the business side of things. They're talking much more of, from the lobby of the existing banking industry in America, which is very stuck in its way. In fact, as, as an aside as to how stuck in the way they are, one of the projects to run on the blockchain, this is a very perverse thing that came in yesterday, 
was, in America they still use these checks, right? You remember them. We had them some time ago, these check things. Um, you can now, there's a service which produces a like photocopy of your check and puts it on the blockchain. So you think, why would you ever want to do that? Because they're so f wrapped up in this world of checks in America that even though it makes absolutely no sense to do a transaction, they're actually embedding it as an image. They're putting the image of the check on the blockchain, whereas, of course, we were, or even on your databases here, imagine you were photocopying every check and putting it in your ledger system. I mean, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be happening, right? It would be a crazy idea. Anyway, that's what they're doing in America. So we shouldn't look too much. We can look a lot at America, of course, but we shouldn't look too much at America. They're not that advanced in this world. Um, let's look at transactions now. We can look at blocks. So we know the integrity of all of this stuff is, is, is secure. My, my premise is it's secure. And one of the reasons I say it's secure is we've got all of this computing power creating it, but we've also got a hell of a lot of people trying to break it. And when you've got a lot of people trying to break stuff, testing it, you know, if you've got a lot of people banging at your main door in your office and it's not breaking down, you know it's probably pretty secure. And that's what's happening all the time here. And people are testing it intellectually. People are testing it by just banging at it. And people are testing it cryptographically by trying to find holes in these algorithms which are used to secure the data. And if there is a hole found in a security algorithm, it's a really big issue. But we can see how difficult it is. The, the NSA have got the largest capability of crypto uh, uh, brute forcing stuff in the whole world. They've got a huge computing capacity. And they can't get into an iPhone. So, I mean, this is an iPhone is only an iPhone, right? It's not, it's not more. This is a whole system designed for that. Let's look at transactions quickly. What you do to make a Bitcoin transaction is something quite, quite interesting. What I do is I take an amount of money and I say who's going to get that money. This is where the chain comes into it. The traceability is coming into this. So let's say I, I, I'm Malice and I'm getting 25 coins for the sake of argument. Let's say I want to give some to Bob. So I want to give some to him. But what I do is I don't create a transaction that gives some to him. I create a transaction that gives some to him and the rest to me. It gives it actually back. So everything's always integral. We've got 25 input, and the first thing that happens is I give 17 to him to buy my stuff, and I get my change back. And that transaction is recorded in this, in this ledger. And what happens now is, let's say that... Um, Bob wants to give the information. He's 17, he wants to give them further. Got eight and nine. So he's got 17, he wants to give eight to Carol, and he's giving nine back to himself. But the whole thing is linked. Everything is signed and traceable right back through the system. And then we say we can go around in a circle even, and that David, who's got these six from before, uh, sorry, he wants to, sorry, excuse me, Carol wants to send six to David. And she wants to send two to Alice, signs it. Sorry, Alice wants to send that. And she signs that with her codes, with her private key, with her password, if you like. All of this cryptography stuff is heavily dependent on keeping your password secure. So all this nonsense about, you know, three characters and two numbers and all of this stuff, this is going completely mad now. And somebody who can solve a password problem is going to be a Nobel Prize winner, I think, in the future. What you get is a traceability of transactions here. And we can follow this transaction, again, in the, by looking at the public database. This is the public system, the blockchain that we run. And this transaction is actually on here, or a transaction is on here. And you can see all the data. It doesn't matter what this is, but this shows how this data is being split. So there's a number coming in on the left. It's been split out, spent and spent, and going out on the right. And this, again, leads to a tremendous amount of traceability in the banking world. It means you're not having individual transactions that you're sort of having to reconcile. You've got a whole flow through the whole thing. And you can build that up, and you can independently um, recreate all of those flows. So what you have here is a traceability. You have an anonymity about the thing. Because at no point have I said who I am who's doing all of this stuff. That's a problem for the financial world, of course. But we do know who is doing it. We can trace all the transactions back through. So the only thing we're missing is a link between the person and their original money that they, they're spending. And that can happen many different ways. I mean, this is if you're talking to a criminal investigation, the police are actually pretty good at getting links between people. That's, that's, what they, that's how they solve crimes, usually, is putting things together. And with KYC and things like that coming into this, 
um, that problem is going to be, be solved forever. And there's a general acceptance within the Bitcoin community that, um, that anonymity is not, a, is not going to be a good thing in the future. It's a very unpopular thing to say in, in the libertarian world of these internet guys. Um, but in fact, when we look at the sources and of, of transactions and things, we look at whether they're coming from countries or whether they're coming from this, this so-called dark net, which you read so much about in the newspaper. The number of transactions we're seeing coming out of these dark nets is, is, is minuscule. It's, it's irrelevant. It, it, you wouldn't even worry about it here if it was that amount of transactions as a percentage of the total number. So we've got this. We've got a traceability. We've got an anom anonymity and not secrecy. We've got a compliance with some of the accounting standards. In fact, because you can trace everything all the way through, all this first in, first out, if you start to trade share certificates where you're doing this sort of, um, I don't know how it all works, but calculating your gains in order of, in order you've got the things and spending them and all of that. Um, it, it all works with that. And above all, you've got trust. And trust is an interesting thing because trust is, of course, what the banking sector, what you guys have been living on and, and believing, and people believe in banks, they believe in banks to give them money. I'll give you my money and you're going to not run away with it, right? That trust is being commoditized now. And that's a very strong thing to happen to an industry that has been based on security and trust. In fact, this technology allows you to do that. So that's on the public side, and I want to just quickly, as time is going, on the private side of things. Um, because we have a conflict here. You can say, well, I don't like doing all of this in public. We're a big organization. We're a banking organization. And we're going to start by investing and creating private blockchain systems, which is what BNP have done by investing in digital asset holdings. There are other ones called R3, which is another big consortium. Um, public blockchains are actually, they have a big advantage in my world. You're protected from your internal IT department. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, the, the, uh, I mean, it's all happening in the big world. Of course, your internal IT department, you're interfacing it. But you're not, pro you, you sort of haven't got this fundamental worry the database is going to disappear. The, um, the Danske Bank in Denmark about, well, now a long time ago, about 2001, they extremely nearly lost their main database. They were so, so close. It's, it's been documented now. They were like one keystroke away from all the backups were gone. IBM had gone home and given up and all of this stuff. And they actually got it back. They were one keystroke away. That cannot happen in this system. Now, it doesn't happen, of course, these days. But anyway, the users are protected from surprises as well. The rules around all of this are, are, are public. The way it all works is normal. And then we get network effects coming into it because being such a large system, you get everybody connected to the same system. And that has advantages when you, when you start to look at... Um, escrow or something like that. I'll come back to that maybe in a second. Private blockchains are what you guys have invested in and what you might be thinking of in the banking industry in general. Now, one thing I want to dispel is, is just having a database. A, a lot of people are using the term blockchain for the term database. I mean, just having a system within your own bank that uses a different technology is, is in my world, rather uninteresting in a way. It's just an, an extension of an existing technology. Where it becomes interesting is when it's be between parties, and, and we'll quickly get to that in a second. We have private blockchains. If you own the blockchain yourself, you set the rules yourself. You validate it yourself. It's not these external people digging away to check this 91th block. You're doing it in-house with your own technology. You can argue it's cheaper. I said there's a tremendous amount of energy spent on, on validating all of this information all the time. And if you're within your controlled, secure environment, you don't have to spend as much money verifying it because you're pretty sure all the time. You tend to have a more reliable system, peer-to-peer -peer systems. I, I grew up with Skype, and it's... Uh, it's a very good system, but it's a very unreliable system because you've got no control of what's going on in the network at any one time. You have to get through it through mass and volume. And of course, with private blockchain, you have the privacy of the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's what's going on. These transactions can't be traced. So it looks like it's the better choice for an institution, and, and I would say that. Um, and one thing a blockchain is good for is between different groups of people where you kind of trust, you either don't trust each other at all or you trust each other a bit. So in the banking industry, you have correspondent banks or your, your, your commercial partners, and you trust them. But you don't trust them completely, right? You want to be checking them all the time. It's why we don't exchange all the information with everybody. Example being something like an escrow situation. This is where a typical case for a blockchain application. Imagine I want to sell something to be a digital asset, something like a domain or a 
or share certificate or something, you have the normal counterparty risk problem that needs to be resolved. If I, give you the, I send you the thing and you have to send me the money, but what if I send you the thing and you haven't sent me the money? How does all that work? And you do that, of course, through, through escrow agents or through banks or something like that. And I send them both to you. That's how house purchases work and stuff like this. It's very normal. Um, and today we have escrow authorities managing that process. Tomorrow we have something called maths, computing, and scripts, or something we call smart contracts. Smart contracts is a very complicated word for something which is actually very, very simple. Um, it just says if this and this happen, then the third thing happens. And you can write that contract, very simple contract, onto the, onto the blockchain. This is actually a scripting language, an independent computer programming language that's been created to do this sort of thing on the Bitcoin blockchain, which is, uh, which is very interesting because it... it it, it's very simple indeed. It's extremely simple, but it still already now allows very complex financial transactions to be to be created. Like, for example, collecting a lot of money in for a cause and for an auction or something, and paying out if the number's reached. You can just have people pay in and pay in and pay in, and then the money will automatically be paid out if the goal is reached. And if the goal is not reached, the money will not be paid out. And there are big. Uh, gambling networks in China who are sitting on top of technology like this exactly because it all runs automatically. Um, so we're replacing an escrow authority, which used to be somebody like a notary in the old days, with a smart contract written in a public system. And that's possible today. So, and it's being used today. It's not just possible today. I'll show you an example later because I've actually done one this morning for you. We'll get to the end of that. Um, and we were talking about smart contracts with a guy from a company called Ethereum who have a different, Dennis will probably talk about them, I don't know, a different digital currency. And he was saying this. This is quite funny. He said, in, he said this, these advantages, some of them are unneeded, but in others they're quite powerful. In fact, they're powerful enough to wait a bit longer for confirmation and to pay three cents for a transaction. For him, paying three cents for a transaction was a large amount of money in the world that he's coming from, which is a bit odd, isn't it, in a world where we're used to paying as consumers or, or, or whatever, as customers of a bank, a lot more. And a transactional cost, he's saying that's a lot, as much as was his statement. And there, therein lies a, lies a story. And, and this is where we come into what I think is the first example of something which is going to be completely broken very soon. Um, which is this cross-border payments and correspondent banking system. We know how this works. You, you guys probably know how it works better than I do, that when you send money, if I want to send money across borders or between banks within the same country, if it's a large country like America, you have the bank, you have the payment system, you have a bank that's got the relationship with the other party, the counterparty, and all of this stuff. You know this, this, this very well indeed. And it's complex, of course, and, it, and it's uh, been one of the sources of funds for some of the larger banks at the detriment of the smaller banks for a, for a very long time. I, I've got an example here of, of what some of the money looks like. Um, oh, this is complicated. This is, but this is a, an industrial guy who wants to raise an, an invoice for $4,800 for somebody over here in a different country, right? And it goes through to his bank, and that's all right. They don't usually charge much because it's a simple thing for them to do. But you go to the correspondent bank who has the relationship with the bank in Brazil, and they charge a bit more because they've built that relationship up. And then they charge a bit more for the Forex transaction, obviously. And then it goes on to the customer. And the net effect of all of this uh, thing is that the, of this transaction is that the buyer is paying, this is a real example, is paying $138 for indifferent transaction fees. And that's money the banking industry is living on. And it's historically been, been, been good to live on that because you had risk in all of this. You were managing risk on behalf of counterparties and all of this stuff. In the whole of this Bitcoin world, in the transactions that we saw, that doesn't really need to happen. You know the money's there. You know it's been transferred. You know it's been verified. You know it's been stamped. So the guy at the end here, the buyer, can transform, can, can talk directly to the supplier. That assumes, of course, in the ideologist world that they don't want to deal with a bank at all. I think that's probably, let's be frank, quite unrealistic. Every business uses suppliers to manage part of their their activities and of course that's going to be a financial institute to measure that manage their financial world so they're going to be looking with their bank for sure but all those guys in the middle they're not really adding a tremendous amount of value anymore um, they're they were adding value in the old days because it was really expensive to build up a relationship 
between a, a Luxembourgish bank and a bank in the Philippines or something. It, you probably didn't have one then. They'd be running through third parties, and they were, of course, taking money for all of that. And in those days, international trade and things was much less, and it was much more exotic to do international trade. So somebody sending money from Luxembourg to Philippines or something, they'd expect to pay money because it was kind of it sounded difficult. Um, but now they can sort of call and click and internet and look at the web page and order online and stuff. Why should the payment thing be difficult? Because after all, all you're doing is debiting and crediting two accounts at the other side of it. So this is where I get to the conclusion that I think we talked about trust. We've got a tremendously reliable and trustable system in blockchain. Um, and to some extent, it's, it's no secret, of course, the bank trusts people. You ask people in the street about trusting banks. Actually, they do trust banks a lot. Even if you ask them, they say they don't. But they, obviously, they do. Um, but we've got a big trust in maths coming along. People are more used to it. And I think we're going to see something like this. Trust in maths winning over trust in people. Would I trust an algorithm or would I trust a person? I, I, I wonder. I think I'd trust an algorithm. Um, and commoditization coming in, because with all of these examples that we use, they can be scaled on a global basis and they can be scaled on a product-by-product product basis. So some of the supplier in the Philippines here, he can deal with all this himself with his customer. He doesn't really need... He can choose any financial institute in the whole world to be doing it, not just his local bank in his village or whatever. So, so this is my, 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 my sort of predictions in all of this stuff. I found that old picture of Belval. I don't know why. I thought it was interesting because it doesn't exist anymore, right? They were, they've been sort of disenfranchised, a lot of commoditization in the steel industry, and we've got still the towers, but that's about it. Um, so they're my predictions. Correspondence banking is the first to go. Relationships and fees are disappearing. I know a bank, an uh, Eastern European bank, who've ripped up their corresponding banking relationship with an old partner. A new, they're a relatively new bank, but, but a real bank, not some fancy internet kids thing. Um, and fees for middlemen, I should be saying that. Middlemen are doomed in the world of transparency, as we know. We see it in, in, in every other industry. Why shouldn't the banking be there? So you have to add value for it. So just as a, as, as a final thing, this morning I, I thought, well, my predictions are all very interesting. Would I stand by them? So I thought, well, how can I be sure that when we come back next year and you say, Michael, you were wrong or you were right, what did I do? So I took this presentation and I, and I put it on the blockchain, as you might want to call it. Um, I created that cryptographic identity for this. I ran it through an algorithm, through a computer program, produced the, that cryptographic identity for it that can only apply to this PowerPoint, to this document. It can never come from another document. It's, it's, it's impossible to find another document with that. And if uh, you come back to me with a copy of a digital copy of this, you'll be able to recreate that code exactly with the same algorithm and say, you said that on this date because I submitted it to the, to the blockchain. I paid four cents because that's what I had to do, chose to do. Remember, everything we put onto the blockchain has to be validated by somebody, so they want some money to validate it. There's an economy around that. And there it is. This is on blockchain.info's site. And you can see the transaction there recorded forever on the internet. So just with that information at the top, which is rather unhandy, I must admit, <laughs> that long stream of, of data, if you came back to me next year and I said, oh, I didn't write that, I wrote something else, I wouldn't be able to change this document. You, the document isn't on the blockchain. The, the cryptographic identity of the document is. So we can do this now. And I could... Do this for every single transaction coming through the door of the bank today. I could do it for every real estate transaction coming in today. The technology exists. It's how we adopt it that's going to be really important. And it's not just on the technological side. We're going to see this commoditization. And I think the most successful financial institutions and insurance institutions and things are those that can sort of unbundle things and put them out with the consumer when the consumer wants them because the consumer needs these services at certain times and the person who gets it in front of the consumer at the right time with the right value proposition can, can, can be fine in that, can really do well in that, I think. It's the real chance for the banking industry. So thank you. We'll see you in a year when somebody copies that number and comes back. Um, yeah, so that's what I... I hope that's interesting. Dennis is now going to talk to us about... Another view on the whole system, I think.